it is very much my pleasure to introduce our first farm family that's going to speak. So Liz and Matthew Flegel are doing the producer presentation tonight. And they farm in Prince Edward County, where much of the farm's activities actually situated around Wapoose Island, uh, which is very much down in Prince Edward County. Their sheep operation consists of 2,000 plus ewes uh, that go to grass May 1st, and they have been a pasture lambing flock for decades. So those per permanent pastures are all on Wapoose Island, but what you're gonna see tonight is more of their activities that have been creeping up county, uh, away from the island, and again, featuring the lambs, uh, as opposed to the uh, ewe flock that's on the island in those permanent pastures. So, I'm going to say just a few things about the Flegel family because I don't think everyone's familiar with them. And I know I myself was very happy to see them come speak to all of you tonight. And I hope this is not lost on everyone because this family has been doing this first with Bob and Aaron, uh, Matthew's parents. They've been doing this sort of thing at this scale for decades. And I mean, literally decades. And there's many people who are not aware of what they do. And that's because they don't go to seek profile. Um, but for the people that know them in the sheep industry, they know they're the real deal. And that's why I was using that language last week uh, and on Twitter too. So uh, it, very, with very uh, great expectation, I'd like to turn it back over to James to play the video that was shot at the farm. And then we'll get into Matthew's live presentation. So James, uh, please roll. Hi, I'm Christine O'Reilly. I'm the Forage and Grazing Specialist with OMAFRA, and I'm here today with Matthew Flugel. Matthew, can you tell us a bit about your farm? Uh, hi, uh, me and my wife Liz, we uh, farm here in Prince Edward County. Uh, we farm about uh, just over 2,000 commercial crossbred ewes, and uh, we're here, hopefully today going to talk a bit about, uh, about the cover crop grazing that we're working on. So our cover crop uh, cover crop grazing takes place on most of our cropping acres, which works out to about 300 acres. Okay. And I know you guys do something really interesting for your summer grazing. Can you tell us a bit about where the sheep go on the perennial pasture? Right. So in the, in the summer, our, uh, in the spring, our ewes head over to Wapoose Island, where all of our perennial pastures are. And that's where they, that's where they do all of their lambing. We're very carefree, uh, hands-off style lambing over there on a rotational grazing system. And then, uh, then midsummer, uh, for the most part, the ewes stay there and the lambs come back off. We breed for lambing on the 10th of May. We find that uh, hits it just right for the ewes to be going on to pasture about the 5th of May, and uh, they lamb well and come into milk well because they're because of that uh, increase in feed quality going out onto onto fresh pasture. So that's that's why we time our lambing for the 10th of May. So our lambs, because they're pasture raised and pasture fed uh, until the early fall, they tend to be ready to market uh, between November and then the very last of them would be February or so. In general, our, we, don't, we don't sell very many 120 pound lambs, put it that way, but we, uh, we bounce back and forth between the kind of uh, 65 pound lamb market and the 95 pound lamb market those are the those are the two that we kind of look for how did you get into cover crops how did you start grazing annual forages so they for us they came actually from the grazing side like we were uh, we were looking for annual forages to graze and then we heard about how great cover crops were <laughs> kind of the opposite from uh, from a lot of folks but uh but yeah uh, Primarily, it was about trying to get both quantity and quality of feed up in the fall for putting weight on lambs was uh, was the driver for us, and uh, and and trying to reduce our try to increase our number of grazing days for our ewes as well. Um, uh, and they started. We used to grow used to grow turnips, which we still do a little bit now and then. We don't have uh, we don't have very much in this year, but. Uh, um, uh, turnips and oats uh, a fair amount um, they haven't been fitting in our rotation as as well since we started growing a significant amount of sorghum sedan grass because the acres weren't available at the right time to plant it in in midsummer um, uh, but uh, 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 
we use them sometimes. <laughs> That all started, uh, I want to say, maybe 10 years ago, but it's really ramped up since we moved on to this property because it uh, it suits it a lot better, and that was about four years ago. So the growing some turnips to graze was about 10 years ago, but, uh, but getting more seriously about an actual rotation that's primarily about forage was about four years ago. Okay. So I get asked a lot, you know, which winter cereal should I, should I use rye, should I use triticale? You've landed on wheat, which is one that I don't see used as forage as often. So why why did you choose wheat? Why does wheat work for you? So a uh, couple of different things. The, the, the stuff that we do keep around for silage, I like the wheat silage um, uh, because the it doesn't decrease in value as fast as rye does. Like in, in May when the dairy farmers around me are harvesting their rye, I have a uh, about 150 ewes a day lambing <laughs> so it's already a hard thing to get rye silage made anyways so wheat silage puts me I'm finished lambing and uh, and I'm already uh, already gearing up to make hay anyways the equipment's all ready to go and uh, and so that's part of it the other part is we're still kind of early days on it and the, se the seed was incredibly available I can get bin run wheat uh, uh, well I, I grow some grain wheat myself and even if I wasn't I can get it from the neighbor cheap and easy at about the right time of year right when it's coming off the combine so uh a bit of both on that we are growing more right now we'll see how that goes next year see if i can uh uh get some more help harvesting and hopefully get around that labor crunch issue in in the middle of may you said that these sheep are about ready to move when did they get put out on this field so they went on to this field uh two days ago this field's about eight acres Okay, and roughly how many head are out here? 1,300. 1,300, okay. About 60 pound ewe lambs. All right, so they've been on here, and what's what was seeded? What cover crop is in this field? So this was sorghum sedan grass that was grazed a couple of times, and the grazing that took place in August, uh, winter wheat was broadcast in right after it was grazed. So mainly what they're eating now is winter wheat. There's a little bit of sorghum left they're still picking at, but it stopped growing a while ago. And what about fertility? Did you apply anything or do you have a fertilizer program for your annual forages? Uh, yes. So our the sorghum sedan grass got uh, got both the nitrogen and uh, and uh, um, sulfur that was that was recommended by the farm center kind of thing, which was definitely necessary. There was like a little piece that it was missing and not much was there. So uh, yeah, definitely a, a good fertilizer program on that. The wheat currently no some of the wheat that will be used for silage in the spring that'll end up getting spring fertilization for sure um, also we while we're putting our nitrogen on if our soil tests are saying that we're particularly behind in something else it's a good chance for us to get some of our P and K on which we do but uh, in general that's more just building because the spreader happens to be going over those acres okay and are you planning to take this field or the field they just grazed as wheat baleage or wheat silage in the spring? So not this field. Um, our different fields of wheat that we're grazing, some of them we're grazing them uh, basically terminally, like grazing them quite hard because we don't plan on taking wheat silage in the spring. Other fields we do plan on taking wheat or rye silage uh, in the spring and those ones will graze quite a bit lighter. Like we'll set our, our U our, our lamb days per acre significantly lower on those to make sure we don't do any damage to the to the stand of wheat. We used to be feeding lambs on perennial pasture as well in the fall, and we're finding we're get we're getting they're in they're we're pretty sure they're gaining better. They look better. They definitely breed better based on feeding them 
uh, uh, annual crops in the fall versus trying to stretch that perennial pasture out longer. And we still get use out of that same pasture. It just becomes ewe feed instead of lamb feed. Right. So just it's easier to have them graze a high quality annual in the fall than to feed them supplement on a lower quality perennial because of the cycles of that crop growth. Oh, Is for sure. Cool. Yeah. yeah. We can't really have a conversation about cover crop grazing without talking about infrastructure. So can you tell me a bit about what do you do for fencing? What do you do for water? Okay, so for fencing, I, uh, I use this uh, Electronet Permanet stuff. Uh, we've got about 120 rolls of this stuff. We couldn't do what we do without it. I, 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 they should give me a commission because it's, it's, I, I couldn't, couldn't say, uh, well, I can say bad things about it, but I have lots of good things to say about it, put it that way. Um, uh, it's, it's proven to be a pretty effective, uh, 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 part of our, of our coyote management, coyote damage management plan. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it definitely slows them down. It definitely keeps the dogs in. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty good that way. We've got pretty good at setting it up. You know, uh, uh, we're, we're, we can get about, about, uh, 20 rolls up in an hour with two people and, and, and then taken down the same in about an hour with two people. So that's got to the point where we're fencing, uh, fencing off a 10 acre field becomes a pretty short job, pretty quick chore. Mm -hmm. um, and just while we're talking about fencing, you're using the electric netting to kind of control where the sheep are grazing. Do you have a perimeter fence around? No, no, this, this, is, this is the this only is, fence. It's both the fence that's holding them on their strip they're grazing and it's the perimeter fence. We don't have any permanent fences here. Okay. Uh, and yes, but water, water we actually have, like uh, we we haul it in, like I have a big uh, uh, six wheel drive army truck with a big tank on the back of it. We don't have any water lines here. If we were only on this farm, we probably would run some water lines, but we also do a lot of grazing um, hay regrowth that's on quite a few different rental farms. For, so for us, it makes more sense to have that as, as portable infrastructure. Although it rained like three inches last week, so it's not so much of a problem. There's plenty of places they can grab a drink today. <laughs> Excellent. So our next phase in the presentation this evening is we're going to ask Matthew to uh, come on and share with us his slide presentation. He's got some slides that will go into a little more depth on some of the things that have been presented here so far. Right. Oh, OK. Hi there, folks. Um, uh, and uh, that, that video was a, a good job, Christina, doing that. It, you put a whole bunch of my nonsense and it almost kind of made sense when <laughs> it was all together and th thanks Christoph for uh for introducing me there um so yeah uh hi Matt Flegel again of course um uh, uh here's just a nice picture of one I'm use saying hi to you guys and welcome you to Wapoose Island although most of the presentation won't be over there but uh but uh as we said earlier this is this is where we spend uh, most of our year and then uh but this presentation is about the day they come off the island so um uh here's just a little bit of uh info about us here um but that was kind of covered in the bio so I'll, I'll, I'll go right into it so um when our lambs are weaned um uh, they go straight into our sorghum sedan grass pastures um uh, this is a picture of them coming off the truck just uh four uh, four or five days after weaning on the island uh it's a bit of a process getting them uh, getting them to the other farm here but uh the sorghum sedan grass we really enjoy grazing it because once they're in it they uh they it's very palatable they take to it well they like the taste of it it, it nothing helps them forget that uh that they not, not nothing helps them move on from missing their mom better than uh than than this stuff once they uh get a mouthful of it they dive right into it and that makes a huge difference with freshly weaned lambs here's another nice picture of them just uh just starting into it this uh, this sorghum, uh, oh yeah, and I'm going to say sorghum for the rest of it, but I'm talking about sorghum sedan grass, just just so you guys know. This uh, this sorghum was planted in um, right after we finished planting corn, so about the third week of May or so. Um, uh, uh, this goes in and uh, gets cut uh, as baleage in late mid to late July, and then uh, these lambs are in here uh, uh, kind of mid-August, early to mid-August is when they start grazing through it. 
And here's a picture of them about ready to move off of this. The, the first, first couple of times we graze it, we just remove the leaf material basically. Um, this, the, the regrowth is a whole lot quicker just taking the leaf off than when it's cut for baleage. When it's cut for baleage, you're uh, kind of 25 days or so until there's something to cut again, until it's ready to cut again. We're grazing the, one of the rotations this year, we were 15 days, we were back on the same acre and there was plenty of feed there for them to eat. Um, uh, it's quite amazing how fast those leaves come back if you have the heat and a, just a little bit of moisture. But of course, it uh, it wraps up at some point. This is a picture of uh, the, I'm not sure either the second or the third time we've grazed it. I'm not quite sure when I took this picture, but by looking at it, it's, it's definitely not just the first time we grazed it because uh, each time we take it a little bit further down because we're getting into cooler weather and it's slowing down. So these acres that have sorghum stand grass on, the first time it's grazed in August, uh, we broadcast uh, winter wheat into it. Um, some of it on the second grazing, we, we uh, tried drilling rye in with a no-till drill. You'll see some pictures of that uh, a little bit later or right away actually. So, um, so yeah, as they are finishing up on the sorghum in, uh, in October, depending on how warm it is, what part of October, but as they're finishing up in it, um, we move them over to different rye that was planted after corn silage. So it was planted, uh, uh, yeah, anyways, that was drilled after corn silage. This is just a picture I pulled up to show this is sorghum that had regrown and wasn't actually ready to graze yet, but the weather was cooling off and it stopped growing. So we were just kind of in a use it or lose it situation, or we thought we were at least. Um, so this has quite a bit of wheat in the bottom of it. You can't see it very well in these photos, but it has quite a bit of wheat in the bottom of it because it's, the wheat's been under there for almost a month uh, from, no, a bit more than a month from planting. And, uh, and we're just nipping off the last bit of leaf of the sorghum before we move into our cereal rye. Here is a picture of just when we started grazing the cereal rye. So this was a corn silage field that was uh, taken off quite early this year. Uh, we had a good, good, uh, uh, good yield off of this, and 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 the, it was at the right moisture on about the sixth of of September, I think, is when we fifth or sixth of September, right early September is when it came off, and uh, got this Ryan right away. This is a picture of Mark, my hired hand, who's been with me for years and couldn't do it without him. He's even better with that fence than I am, so he's, he's uh, invaluable. And this is uh, this picture was taken just probably two minutes after we opened the gate into there, they had, uh, they were very interested in the rye right away. No, uh, no hesitation whatsoever getting into that. And this is another picture of them on cereal rye, just at a different angle. And uh, I took this picture, uh, put it in here mainly to show that it looks like there's not very much feed there in these pictures. And the same thing when you're standing there, it looks like not a whole lot of feed. Um, but we are getting about 350, uh, uh, 350 lamb days per acre. Uh, that's, I'm sorry to the beef guys out there. You're going to have to take that and divide it by maybe eight or so anyways, but, uh, about 350 lamb days per acre. And for reference, uh, knee high alfalfa regrowth is about 500 lamb days per acre. So that looks like it would be. Uh, way, way, way less feed than knee-high alfalfa, but it, in reality, it's actually two-thirds as much feed as that, which, uh, which, and you get into this time of year and any alfalfa that is still around, the leaves have wilted off and it's not, not any good, where this stuff is, uh, we'll have some feed samples I'll show later, and uh, yeah, it's pretty good stuff. Here's a picture showing how hard we graze it, because in, this, is, this is a field that we do plan on taking for baleage, um, uh, so we target removing about three quarters of it. Um, uh, based on this picture, we probably didn't even quite go that far on this certain field, but uh, but it's 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 a matter of hours. The difference between more or less grazing. So sometimes it goes a little early, sometimes it goes a little later. Here's another picture showing uh, showing just the before and after, and 
I have the little arrow there to show what that arrow is pointing at is sorghum sedan grass that regrew in in uh, uh, after the last grazing of it. It even though most of it had uh, wasn't growing anymore, this grew up anyways, and uh, and of course uh, uh, died off as the weather got cold. And there was the same stuff in the left hand side of this picture. And even brown and dead, they still love grazing that sort of sedan grass, even though it's right amongst rye that's that's pretty tasty stuff, they still ate it. So the earlier slide showing uh, us concerned about using it or losing it with the sort of sedan grass, I guess we don't need to worry about that so much because uh, uh, they know best, they know what's good, and they, they were still grazing it just fine, all browned off like that. Uh, what did I do? Sorry, folks, I think I messed up the. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what happened with my slideshow. Can anyone, can, uh, can anyone else see the slideshow? We can, can still I, see it. Uh, Matt, yeah, you just, uh, you can move on to the next slide. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just somehow okay. it's uh, giving me closed captions. I don't know if you guys are seeing that. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, we are. Keep going, Matt. We'll figure out the closed captions. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, here's another uh, picture of them on there. I forgot what I was going to say for this one, but it's a nice picture. And it, it, it's never nice this time of year to, uh, to have something nice and green. Uh, and the same thing here. The uh, the. Yeah, once again, this is this still grazing. This is still rye in this picture. Uh, here's a picture of the, the water truck that I was referring to in the video there. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's imperative in the summer to be able to get the amount of water they need to them. And often when we're grazing, uh, especially when we're grazing hay growth and cover crops, and often there can be places where it's very hard to get the water into. So this uh, this uh, this baby here does the trick as I can, uh, it'll drive anywhere even with 10 tons of water on it. And um, yeah, that's how we get it around. And we have a couple other tanks that are just on hay wagons, but we don't move them full. We just use this as a, as a nurse tank for them most of the time, because this can safely go up and down the road. It can, uh, we're pretty close to the lake. We're only about a kilometer away from Lake Ontario. So, uh, so there's, there's, there's water available all the place. It's just not, on our farm, couldn't put a well in, no matter how hard we tried. The folks before us tried, there's no water at all. Here, I put this picture in, uh, just to remind me to talk about um, when I'm grazing cover crops on uh, other people's crop fields, like after other people's uh, wheat, which we do sometimes, and also grazing crop residues that belong to other farmers. I find talking about all the, uh, all the soil benefits and the nutrient cycling benefits. Sometimes I don't get a whole lot of traction, even those are even those are even though those should be the important stuff. But I get talking about how they clean up the fence rows and uh, and if there's uh, if there's wire and junk in there that you want to clean up, uh, the the sheep can find it. And uh, and if you plan on removing the fence row, then they can clean it up and you can get equipment in there without damaging it. Somehow that gets more traction than uh, than all the benefits of the uh, the cover crop and the manure on the field. But whatever brings them on board, uh, um, uh, that's that's great. They they like seeing their fence rows cleaned up like this. So here is the forage uh, analysis that I was uh, was saying I would share earlier um, uh, of some of that rye. Um, I'm kind of kind of new to the using forage analysis much, uh, but uh, but I'm trying to get a little bit more scientific about what I do. Um, and uh, uh, right, so this was done just, we basically clipped the rye to imitate how we were grazing it. So this is about the top three quarters of the, of the blades of the rye there. And um, to my untrained eye, it looks like pretty good feed, but uh, to, I'm sure some of you guys would be more familiar with the uh, feed analysis and, and probably get more out of this than I do. I'll show you the next one here is the wheat. So the wheat uh, is was showing higher protein and lower TDN, which for feeding out my lambs, uh, feeding out U replacement lambs, which is the main ones that were on this stuff. I'm not quite sure which one's the better feed, but uh, I'll get 
chatting with my, the nutritionist I'm working with to uh, to compare the two to decide whether we should be ramping up the rye or ramping up the wheat more. And uh, here is some oats as well. The wheat, the oats, just like uh, just like the wheat and rye, we broadcast some of that into sorghum sedan grass in August and some of it into soybeans in August. Uh, so that sprouts underneath the soybeans and after the soybeans are combined, then the, uh, the oats or wheat, whichever, uh, take off after the, after the soybeans come off. So these were oats. I actually don't have any pictures of it, but you guys know what oats look like. Um, growing after soybean harvest and that's what my ulams will be moving into tomorrow actually we're just finishing off our rotation around the wheat and the rye and they'll be moving into these oats that have some turnips planted with them and here moving on we've got uh the other half of what i was going to talk about is the corn stover grazing that we do with our ewes so our ewes have been on corn stover now for about three weeks uh, yeah, yeah, about three weeks now. Um, as long as the, the snow cover stays pretty low where we are in Prince Edward, um, because we pretty low on the moisture front all times a year around here, which uh, is handy in the winter for, uh, for grazing stover for sure. Um, uh, and it's pretty tasty stuff. As you can see, we got a little friend there um, uh, in the background. Who, uh, who he's, he, can, he can go wherever he wants to go and he chooses to come here. So there must be some good stuff in there. Uh, here's a picture of the before and after with the grazing stover. I've uh, I found that the most important thing with it, with the for us grazing sheep on stover, is to is the timing of when you move them, when when they've had enough, because it's hard to tell. It's in this picture it doesn't look really obvious, uh, uh, or at least I find it doesn't look really obvious. And here's another picture showing straight down on my feet the before and after. It's not, um, it's not uh, uh, obvious right away when to move them, but I've got one more picture here that's actually going to be useful. The last two were just to show you how hard it is to tell um, uh, uh, when, we're, when we're grazing stover when to move them. But this picture right here, you pick up, this is a, this is a stock that had, had two ears on it, so it made for a better picture, of course, but uh, in, any husk, they, enjoy the like they, they go around and clean up any grain that's down first of course and then they'll uh graze the top leaves of the plant they'll graze the skinny parts of the stalk like the tassel they'll they'll eat quite a bit which yeah, i'm surprised but they do and then they'll eat the top uh, half of the husks then they'll go around and start chewing on on stock and stuff like that before they go back to the bottom half of the husks so the husks are actually quite useful in telling when it's time to move them. When you see a lot of the husks looking like this picture, then uh, then they're, they're still eating quite well, but they're about to be not eating very well. And I find if I move them at this point, I have no problem leading up to breeding with my, uh, with my ewes grazing stover with, with basically no supplement. Like I um, often will, feed some bales of baleage maybe one day out of the week if uh if there's no if there's no grass resources where we're grazing them sometimes on some of the farms we're grazing corn stover there's some hay regrowth that they have access to but if for some reason we're on only stover for a whole week then they'll get about a half day's ration worth of uh alfalfa hay just to uh I don't know, just just because I'm nervous about them eating nothing but stover. Really, I think they do just fine eating nothing but it as long as uh, I move them at this point. Um, so, and I guess I should say with the stover, uh, we hit about uh, 250 U days per acre. So with our with our uh, 2100 U's that are out there at the moment, we're uh, that's about eight acres a day or so should be yeah about 80 years a day or so that that's that's where we're targeting or shifting so and that wraps that up i hope that was uh, a a bit of interesting uh, info about uh, about grazing uh, grazing cereals and grazing uh, stover okay thank you very Thanks, much guys. matthew so um We've got our time marker set here, so we don't have much time for questions right at this moment. But as James said early on, 
in the discussion. We're going to have that time after Dr. Earhart presents, and we can deal with some of the questions. And Matthew, maybe if it suits your fancy, you can go into the chat uh, and deal with some of the questions there as you wish. Uh, and then afterwards, when we come back after eight o'clock, we'll try to prioritize those questions that are specific to the cover crops uh, versus some of the other ones that get into the, say, the marketing uh, questions or say parasite management. We'll try to deal with the cover crops ones first um, so the beef gang can get some value out of it too. And then we'll move on. So there we see uh, Richard has turned on his camera. So welcome, glad to see you joining us tonight. <clears throat> so by way of introduction for Richard, uh, who's reasonably well known amongst the sheep people in Ontario. Uh, he's been the small ruminant specialist at Michigan State University since 2009. He holds joint appointments between the departments of animal science and large animal clinical sciences, so between the vet college and animal science. He received his bachelor's in animal science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his master's and PhD training at Cornell. His interest in extension and applied research were fostered by a diversity of experience with sheep, including rearing purebred sheep during his youth, shearing professionally since his early teens, field research in New Zealand and Australia. And then Richard has managed his own flock of commercial ewes on an accelerated program for the last 20 years. First in the hills above Ithaca, uh, that's in New York, of course, at Cornell, and now in Michigan since he's moved there. He's no stranger to Ontario sheep farms, uh, since he often went back and forth between New York and Michigan via the 401 and would stop in and see farms here and has spoken to numerous audiences here, uh, not only as a sheep specialist, but even back when he was at Cornell uh, doing his postdoc, he had already started speaking to some of the sheep groups in eastern Ontario. His applied research interests revolve around increasing production efficiency in small ruminants through strategic nutritional management, including whole farm forage utilization, which brings us to our topic tonight and how Richard is going to speak uh, to the use of these cover crop forages in lamb finishing programs. So turning it over to Dr. Earhart, glad to have you aboard. Yeah, thanks so much, Christoph. Yeah, it's really nice to um, connect with Ontario producers and hope to get over there again before too long. Um, yeah, so I've been interested in grazing systems for sheep pretty much for my whole uh, career as a sheep specialist and um, a little history on that you know my predecessor Dr. Rook here in Michigan State did a lot of work with annual forages integrating them into grazing systems as cover crops as part of an annual rotation like a foodles do and um, that was an excellent talk by the way I really appreciated that talk and um, so I've so I've been interested in this for a long time and what I'm going to present today is a little bit of a more formal study than I've done um, as a specialist, where we've actually done, I guess I call it some legitimate research, looking at um, kind of applying cover crop grazing to lamb production. Now, the reason why we did that, it isn't like necessarily the only place that cover crops or annual forages can fit sheep production, as I'll describe but it gives us like a really nice barometer to look at forage quality and the potential of that quality in finishing lambs. And, you know, do these forages have enough nutrients to really put adequate fat depth and protein deposition? And how do they, so the, how do they affect carcass quality? And then how do they affect um, maybe even eating quality as I'll talk about. So, um, yeah, so we all know that, um, I don't, I'll just, these, these are some quick, background slides. I think you've had plenty of this, but yeah, cover crops make a whole lot of sense in so many ways. Um, they help, you know, crop farmers by increasing their diverse biodiversity. Um, they feed the soil with living roots and they, you know, protect the soil as kind of an armor from erosion. They do so many things and it's really, you know, a lot of it has to do with the root action as you've learned in, I'm sure in your seminar series. Um, and um, so, yeah, they're, they're like, you know, a no brainer really in terms of crop production, but certainly they can also benefit livestock production, as you know, as you well know. And, um, you know, they can, first of all, is a simple enough thing. They can reduce the cost of a cover crop in terms of like, you know, a lot of crop farmers who are committed to having cover crops already, you know, working in livestock can reduce the cost. If you have a partnership program, like I have, these are actually my own sheep. 
Um, I graze my ewe flock on cover crops each fall. Um, I have a neighboring farm who's got a lot of land. I'm land limited. So um, I basically just pay for the seed. He does the seeding. And it's kind of a win-win situation in so many ways in terms of his soil health. Um, and um, potentially, as you probably learned, you know, there are some opportunities maybe for increased even crop yield, certainly enhanced nutrient recycling. For sheep farmers, it definitely lowers the cost of feeding um, and it fits many parts of production as I'll describe. And essentially, you know, you know, managed in a cover crop scenario where you're grazing typically late in the season, maybe just a single pass, you've got, you know, parasite free forage. So that's pretty sweet. Um, so, you know, some of the added value again is that you leave most of the nutrients in the soil, as you've learned, um, the roots are there. So that's a lot of the biomass that's really important in this, um, in, 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 you know, in a lot of things, in, in, in bringing carbon back into the soil and reducing the carbon footprint of sheep production, um, improving soil um, to residue contact, which helps enhance the recycling, just that trampling effect, you know, has, a, has an impact as well. And yes, you know, those, the, the nutrients, the, you know, the urine, the manure that uh, com comes out of the sheep, obviously, and out of the cattle, um, really is more rapidly available compared to the residue. Yeah, and then you can provide some income to counter establishment costs. So you think about it in terms of a balance sheet, there's a bunch of direct costs that are impacted, indirect costs to consider, direct income and indirect income. You know, some of these things, as uh, Matthew was pointing out, are sort of harder to sell sometimes to a crop farmer. But, you know, as we gather more data, as people get more experience with this and they see that, you know, some of the negative impacts like soil compaction turn out to be not a really big issue in many cases, especially with sheep, um, you know, they get more and more confident. And I was, <laughs> I was very intrigued to hear that selling them on cleaning up your uh, hedgerows is another win. So I'll have to add that to my list. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So, um, yeah, so there's lots of ways that you can uh, use cover crops to increase your production efficiency in sheep systems. Um, it can be within a cropping system. You can use it after so many different situations regarding, you know, vegetable production. I've got lots of small farms who, you know, have cash crop vegetables and they fit many different parts of the summer. They bring their sheep or goats in and, you know, they get this excellent um, cover crop grazing opportunity. As was described, you know, fencing and water are barriers, but certainly pretty easily overcome. And I can usually, um, you know, uh, fix that with some good electronet fencing. Certainly the cover crops that we graze in, um, in cover, true, the cover crop scenarios, the late season grazing, the forage water content of those crops is so high that they almost have too much water. If you graze a field of turnips, it's almost an issue. The animals are almost drowning. So um, you can get some great synergy between livestock and crop programs um, uh, within your own programs. As Matthew does, it sounds like he also, they also do it and Liz do with partnerships with neighboring farms as well. So you have all those great opportunities and you get, you know, enhanced nutrient scavenging, soil protection, all these benefits. Yeah. And then the other thing, you know, obviously you can stockpile these Many of these crops stockpile well, extend your grazing season. We've got a few farmers here, even in this part of Michigan, who can graze almost 11 months of the year. They've got stockpiled forage in the winter, grazing through the snow, not, not every winter, but some winters, grazing through the snow. And then they've got early season, you know, rye coming up. So they just feed for a very short period of time. Um, so in sheep production systems, it can fit a number of, 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 points of production. What I'm going to talk about mostly in this talk is actually this point where it fits in as a background finishing system. You can get some pretty outstanding gains on these lambs, but what I found is that's more during the warm months of the year. These higher gains I'm suggesting here, these, you know, gains that are approaching 300, a little over 300 grams per day are typically, you'll see those more in a summer grazing scenario when we've grazed prickly brassicas in the summer, or maybe brassica sorghum sedan mixes. It's more realistic to see those gains more in the 250 gram range, which we see more in the fall, and that you can kind of count on a bit more, um, as I'll describe. The other way they're used is just for the ewe flock. You know, they, you can flush ewes on them. You can gain a lot of body condition on ewes in a fairly short period of time. They're awesome for growing replacement ewe lambs. 
which we just typically recommend kind of a moderate growth rate, which these really fit nicely. Um, just a couple pictures here of some cover crops. These happen to be my own sheep grazing. I work with a lot of farmers who do a very similar system where we graze on other people's land. So they want a crop that doesn't grow in the spring. So this oats, turnips, sometimes a forage rape combo is what we typically use. We'll graze it right through the snow. And this is just a nice picture with a turn up in a fresh uh, early season snow. And then it leaves this armament still on the, on the uh, ground. I use this also in some of my pasture, my pasture improvement programs at home. And I can direct drill right through this residue in the spring. And um, it works really well. So, you know, as I got more interested in cover crop grazing, I started to consider some projects with our um, forage agronomist, uh, Dr. Kim Cassida. So all this work I'm talking about here, um, it's pretty much a full partnership with, with her program. And I'm real lucky to have her at MSU because uh, she actually raises some more room and it's has sheep block herself. Um, so you know, we, we started considering you know, what are the ideal cover crops in this scenario that we're gonna grow. And the scenario we're talking about here is mostly after winter wheat. You know, do brassicas alone or a high brassica content cover crop, is that going to be maybe an ideal cover crop for, for land and animal performance? Um, I'm not going to talk about land performance in this talk. I'm going to talk about animal performance because um, that's pretty much what we have data on. We are just mentioned, we are definitely looking at the um, soil and land part of it as well in future crop yields. And we've gotten funded for the project I'm talking about to look at that. So, but I'm not reporting on that today. So we wanted to consider whether brassicas or like high proportion brassicas might be a better fit versus more of a, a mixture that you might put some warm season grasses in and some cereal grains. You know, the yields can vary. The nutritional value certainly varies. You start putting in some of these more high fiber species, maybe you'll get better <laughs> nutrition for animals, maybe not. And that's some of the questions that we had. And yeah, maybe the environmental services might differ. The root structures, you know, how they sequester nutrients might differ. They have, they have different root structures that mine nutrients and protect differently. So these are some things we're interested in. So as far as brassicas go in both cattle and sheep production, there has been some concern of, um, of using them in, in, in livestock production because they do have some plant secondary compounds like this SMCO compound that can cause some um, issues. Um, it can cause a form of anemia um, and um, it may alter nutrient utilization as well. It's also been thought that it can um, perhaps impact meat flavor. So, you know, for grazing animals on some uh, forages that have high SMCO content, which would be many of the brassica forages, you know, is that an issue? And that's one of the things we want to address here. So the objectives of this study I'm talking about now are to use cover crop grazing systems using lamb growth really as a barometer for forage quality. So, you know, the rate of growth is going to give us a pretty good indicator of the quality of forage. You know, we can analyze this, which we have chemically, but really the bottom line, right, is how well these lambs grow. Um, and um, so we wanted to see if and how they would fit in a more practical sense as part of a complete lamb finishing system. So can we take lambs, you know, from essentially weaning to market off of these crops or can or or how does that compare to a system where we might background them for say you know several months on these on these grazing systems and then maybe one month of finishing so we compared we compared these things as i'll describe in terms of animal health growth performance carcass and meat quality um, and meat quality includes some sensory analysis. So we got some consumer panels in even during COVID to do this. So that, that was an interesting uh, thing that we did. So the land systems that we're going to talk about here were just a grain finish. I'll call it kind of a control or a baseline standard finishing system. They run the grain system for eight weeks, or excuse me, six weeks. We had grain background on a brassica cover crop and then finishing on grain. So four weeks on a cover crop, four weeks on grain. Then we had brassica cover crop straight through for eight weeks, and then a mixture cover crop, which I'll describe for eight weeks. So we had basically two grazing systems, grazing plus grain, and then grain alone. 
Um, so yeah, we did, we're doing this over three years. We're not finished with the study. This is year three right now. We just killed the first set of grain lambs last week. We're going to kill the uh, um, forage fed and the background lambs next week, actually. So it's almost over the whole project. Um, we used a number of different breeds depend, and we had to kind of block them. Some years we had you know, the same mixture, which were typically Dorset times polypay um, genetics. This year we added some white Suffolk, which is a terminal sire um, on this U base because we didn't have quite enough. So these were all blocked according to treatment. And these are the th four treatments. Again, we had grain, which is acronym. Sorry, I had to use that here. GRN, background should be obvious, BKG. Brassica only might not seem quite as obvious and mix. Okay, so those are our treatments. And this is our design. So, you know, we um, basically had these um, strips that we had in a field, as I'll describe, and these are all the measurements that we took. So we took blood samples, we weighed them weekly, we did before and after grazing measurements. We looked at the botanical composition, like the in, how the diversity of these mixtures might have changed over time. And um, and again, this was an, a six-week study for grains and an eight-week study for the uh, pasture treatments. So just a typical field. We had these strips. We had nine strips, three um, uh, replicates of each treatment. And these are just, you know, two different years. We did the same thing this year. Um, so this was in a corn wheat rotation, this field. And we pretty much planted these cover crops in early uh, August, late July. And there was some manure incorporated. So here's the mixtures. So we had our brassica dominant mixture was, brassica only mixture was rape, radish, and turnip. And then the diverse mixture had the same things. Um, but it had some pearl millet, Japanese millet, some clover, some field peas, a number of different things, as you can see. Um, so the, we, that, that's how, um, that's the diversity. So there's some, there's basically the same base, but then some added warm season cereal grains and also a few legumes. Um, here's the planting. One of the years, it was like super dry for Michigan. And so we had a delayed germination in our year one, but it still, you know, worked out pretty well. We just had a little bit lower yields that year. So we just weighed these animals weekly. You know, we gathered them up. We had one of these Prattley systems that we use out in the field, which is really handy to get, you know, lambs weighed efficiently. There's just a few pictures of that. And then, you know, we have the benefit of having a lot of undergraduates who are interested in helping with these projects. And we take these quadrant measurements before and after grazing. There's a student working on one here. We dry the forage, we separate it. And um, here's just an example of the diversity of our mixture versus our bra brassica only treatment, which was pretty much brassica only. I know this picture probably showed a couple of blades of wheat here. This varied a little bit from year to year, but not too much. So it's a brassica dominant one. And here actually the brassicas are shown here as well. This was still fairly dominant even in, diver in, in the diverse mixtures. Um, and I'll show you the results in just a few minutes for that. Um, so the, we had lambs on feedlot. We pretty much had to transition them as quick as possible from pasture to grain. And we do that in about seven or eight days on soy hull pellets. So we use soy hull as it's a byproduct feed of the soy milling industry. And we put them on full feed soy hull pellets directly off pasture. And we transition them over seven days from like 80% soy hulls to about 20% soy hulls. And we get very little problems with acidosis doing that. So we can do a really fast transition that way. Um, so uh, as far as the grazing, we move the animals approximately weekly, some days a little early, some days a little late, weeks a little late, based on um, the weather mostly, so we could weigh lambs when they were dry. Um, yeah, and we, um, our allowance, which is, also, which is an important factor, of course, um, is we um, allowed them enough forage for um, nine to 10% of their pen's body weight on a daily basis. So, you know, we estimate these lambs are eating sort of 4% of their body weight in dry matter. So they're consuming, say, sort of 40, maybe 50% of the available biomass, I would, I would estimate. Um, and that's how I allocated it that way. I think that worked out pretty well. 
Um, they were killed um, in at in Detroit at Wolverine Packing, which is nice that we have a packing plant not too far away. And um, we all we went down there to do our um, our carcass measurements. So our carcass measurements, which I'll describe, you know, pretty standard stuff really. We took at the twelfth rib, we did eye muscle depth, loin eye areas, um, back fat depth here, and then body well depth. Some people call this the GR measurement. Um, it's about 11 centimeters from midline, and we did that as well. Um, and those are things. So we also analyzed, you know, took blood samples from these lambs to get some indicators of their um, of their metabolism, their energy and protein metabolism. Um, and then for meat analysis, yeah, we looked at a number of different things, including cooking loss, um, color. Uh, shear force, which is physical shear force, kind of a measure, of, sort of a measure of tenderness, hopefully. And then we did some chemical analysis as well. So we looked at the, you know, fat content of the muscle itself, which is a pretty good indicator of lamb eating quality. And um, this was done at Texas Tech because we weren't set up to do that, like we hope. And um, yeah, so that was really, really great. Andrea Garman here, who's our new um, our new meat specialist actually has worked a lot on lamb meat quality, both here and even in with a, a collaborating with Australians and their big studies at, when she was at Texas Tech. So we're lucky to have her. And we did this at a private uh, lab because we couldn't do it on campus because of COVID restrictions. So we got the opportunity to do it in Grand Rapids and we um, subjected, you know, subjected, <laughs> we, we gave these panelists this wonderful opportunity to eat this lamb. And um, most of them actually, important to say, they were people who had consumed lamb before. So these were people with, you know, a taste for lamb. They weren't the typical naive, maybe American sheep, you know, uh, consumer who probably hasn't had lamb hardly at all in their life. Um, so yeah, so they were able to, um, so, you know, each treat, the, the, the panelists uh, tasted lamb loin, a piece of lamb loin, I think it was a half loin they got to eat from half, from, you know, each of the treatments and it was carefully set up so that we could do a nice statistical analysis. And the attributes that they looked at were, that, that we asked them about to scale in a hundred point scale were juiciness, overall acceptability, like how much they liked it, the flavor and the tenderness. So it's basically four things. So here's the botanical composition of one year's mix. And you can see the brassica only had, you know, dominant brassica, a little bit of wheat that came through. And the diverse mix, on the other hand, was also dominant in brassica, but it had a few other things, had some um, warm season grasses and some peas. This year, you know, this, these diverse mixes, sometimes the reason why we plant them is we get such diversity of weather. This year, we had a totally, the diverse mix is completely different. We had a warm, wet end of the summer and we have um, ton, tons of the pearl and Japanese millet. So it's a very different mix this year. So just to let you know, the brassica component shown here in green was dominant in both mixes. So there, there is a difference, but not as much as you we, we would have guessed. So, but even this little bit of warm season grass you know, little bit, it's like 20, 30% does make a pretty significant difference in its nutrient profile, as you'll see in a minute. Um, so the total biomass, our crops, I wouldn't say they, I would brag about their mass. Um, we had, these, these are the growth and it, we typically maxed out the growth right about the second week. So when we, let me, let me back up a second. So these were all Mayborn lambs weaned in early August put on a pasture, gotten used to grazing, and then put on this study right about beginning um, the first week of October. And so these crops right here would have um, reached their peak right about the end of October, and then kind of sometimes lost a little biomass actually by the end of the study, which is right about this time of year. So um, this year, um, I can tell you in year three, we're somewhere up here. So we've got like significantly more forage. We've got probably 30, 40% more forage this year um, with the same mixtures planted on, we, we reciprocate between two fields. So it's the same field as 2019. So in terms of dry matter, you know, 
Just to kind of summarize this quick, we have brassica compared to mix. We see a slight increase in dry matter as these plants kind of desiccate. You know, these are stockpiled forages. They're losing a little bit of their water content. They're still pretty wet. I mean, they're 10 10 percent dry matter here. They're coming up into you know close to 20 percent here. Still like lots of water in these plants. The fiber content's pretty different. Okay, the NDF is a measure of fiber, and it's much higher in the mix. Um, uh, in the mixture. Um, the ADF, which is a measure of um, acid digestible fiber, acid digestible fiber, which is a more less um, digestible fiber, um, was also higher as you'd predict. Crude protein levels were hovering in the upper teens and they were pretty consistent over the whole study period. Um, I'll tell you that I can pretty much say that the limitation for GLAM growth in most of these systems is not crude protein content. It's almost always going to be energy, and a lot of that's going to be dictated by fiber content of the forage and the digestibility of the fiber. Um, so the gains that we saw, you know, here we've got lambs growing like gangbusters, of course, on the grain mix. And you can see they're, you know, close to 400 grams per day. Um, and they, you know, they slacked off just a little bit as their feed efficiency wanes. Um, so these lambs, our target was 70% of their mature size. So these are sort of, um, you know, 170, 180 pound ewes. We're hitting like 130 pounds um, would be our, our kind of target weight for, these are all weather lambs. And so that's kind of what, our, what our, our goal was. And we hit that pretty much perfectly. We actually got a little bit bigger than that with some of these grain-fed lambs. Our background lambs, here they're here, you're showing them here. They're kind of a dark green. Sorry, it's all hard to see. Um, they were, you know, all the pasture lambs here were growing at eh, 200, a little bit more than 250 grams at best. Then as soon as we put, of course, the background lambs were put on grain that grew cr like crazy. And the background lambs um, that were, you know, put on grain after they adapted to it grew at the fast, highest rate of any lambs. So there was a lot of compensatory gain here and very efficient gain as well, which I didn't describe. But th these had higher or, you know, more in enhanced feed to gain ratio. So, you know, lower feed to gain ratio is like less than four. Um, and um, so that, that was one of the advantages of this system. It's a very efficient system. And then a um, couple other little things, subtle things to point out. They're not really that subtle, actually, when you're looking at the animals out there, though. We saw a decline in growth rate of the pasture lambs. And as you might predict, this could be, I think it's really two things. Forage quality is changing just a little bit. But actually, you know, I can't absolutely prove this, but I've got some blood metabolite work that kind of shows it. Um, this is probably more a factor of temperature. <laughs> These lambs are in cold condition here right about this time of year, um, late November, early December. Here it's a lot warmer, so their energy expenditure is higher and they're, you know, um, not able, they have to, you know, burn more energy for heat. And I think that's what kind of affected their growth a little bit. They still, you know, okay, so they slacked off in growth, maybe 20, 30%. But they still are, are growing, obviously, and you know, there's a, their net energy is um, positive. So um, here's just a few pictures of grazing, just to remind you. Yeah, right around here, things are getting cold. They're not growing quite as fast here. Early season, they're growing faster, and you know that's kind of reflected a little bit. I don't have this broken down very well for you here, but anytime the lambs were on. Um, the grazing diets, they had elevated um, free fatty acids, which is an indicator of energy balance. So they were, you know, not in quite as much positive energy balance. Interestingly, the plasma urea nitrogen levels, which are a readout of protein metabolism, were always lower on brassicas, which kind of speaks to the fact that maybe the protein utilization of these animals is somehow altered on brassicas. And there's a pretty big body of literature to support that. Although, you know, it isn't clearly understood exactly why. They think some of these plant secondary compounds might inhibit some protein utilization. But on the other hand, these lambs were growing like crazy. So it had little, no real negative impact on them. But it's just kind of a curious sidebar. As far as gain, we also looked at gain per unit land. And, you know, we did not design this study to, act to, to maximize gain per unit land. 
but um, we did, you know, see that we would have higher gains um, a couple weeks into the study, and then a little bit lower, and um, that gives you an idea for that. As far as the carcass traits go, um, we had low, smaller um, lambs, or excuse me, larger lambs on the grain-based diets, about 30 kilos compared to like 27, 28 kilos. So they're, cut, they're like five, six pounds lighter. Um, and um, so that's important to consider in this system. Uh, as far as back fat depth, we actually were able to give what I would call adequate finish to these lambs on pasture. They weren't terribly different than our grain fed lambs. And some of that was by our study design. So we managed to get enough subcutaneous fat onto them. Body wall depths were also a little different, a little bit leaner. Um, loin eye areas were a little bit lower in our pasture lambs because they weren't quite as large. And perhaps, you know, the quality of protein might've been a little different. Eye muscle or the utilization of protein, a little different. Eye muscle depths were followed the exact same idea. Our yield grades were a little bit different, but these are, you know, yield grade twos in our system considered to be a pretty good lamb. And these were just slightly less than yield grade two, rounded up to two, all graders would, and they'd be like a nice grade of lamb. And um, the dressing percentages, interestingly, weren't very different at all. They weren't different at all, which kind of surprised us. We expected lower dressing percentages with the pasture fed lambs. That, that did surprise me. In fact, they numerically, they're a little bit greater. Here's just a couple pictures of these lambs. If you like pictures of carcasses, I kind of do. Um, here's some of our cover crop mixed lambs compared to our background lambs. And you can see, you know, they were kind of hard to pull apart. The grain fed lambs looked a little different, but you know, it, you know, you walk up and down the line, we were blinded to the treatments. You know, sometimes we could get a sense some of the pasture fed lambs were a little bit thinner, but it wasn't that obvious. They look really nice. Um, looking at the meat, um, we had cooking loss differences. Um, you may know this already, but you know, grain fed lambs are less of a deep red color compared to pasture fed lambs. Even the ones that were background fed had a richer red color they retained even from not being on grass for four weeks. Um, in terms of what we call, it's called lightness. Um, it's a lighter color as well. So our pasture fed lambs um, had a lighter, or excuse me, our grain fed lambs had a lighter color than our pasture fed lambs. And then a um, couple of, yeah, so that's pretty much what we saw. We saw major differences in color and um, that's kind of the main thing. The sheer force, the tenderness did not vary at all. So these pasture fed lambs and grain fed lambs were equivalent. Um, and, um, but there were some differences in color, which were kind of pretty, pretty obvious, actually. I could almost pick them out just visually on that basis. Um, as far as the sensory analysis, that got pretty interesting. We only did sensory analysis one year. So the, all the other data I showed you was, was two years of study. And our Cisco model um, accounted for both of those years in, in, in our design there. Um, so we, we found that the brassica lambs, that the flavor of the brassica lambs surprised us actually was significantly preferred, you know, higher preference in terms of flavor and juiciness over all the other treatments. Our hypothesis would have been probably, you know, to expect the grain fed lambs. They were all, let me give you a perspective though. Everyone liked these lambs. They just like these a little bit more would be the way I'd say it. Um, tenderness, um, really, you know, see a numerical difference as well. And they were all highly acceptable. But the differences we did see that turned out to be statistically significant were in flavor and juiciness. So that surprise, that was kind of a surprise. So that I can say minimally that brassica does not imbue negative flavors and it may even be a positive, at least in our study. Okay. Okay, so just to summarize this stuff, and give you some time for questions. The lambs and grain diet grew faster and greater carcass weight and fatness, sub subcutaneous fatness. We did not see any difference, and I might have breezed by that quickly, in um, marbling, in intramuscular fat. Um, lambs on the background system had compensatory gain and improved feed efficiency. The lambs on the brassica seeding had a little bit different protein metabolism. We don't quite understand. Um, all the lambs graded nicely. The grain-fed lambs um, had a little greater yield grade 
The loin chops from the cover crop lambs were darker and deeper red color. Intermuscular fat content was in that preferred range of 4%, which is kind of optimal for eating quality. And we did not see any differences between our treatments. And yes, like I just described, the consumers preferred the brassica lamb slightly over the rest of the lambs. So yeah, just wanted to thank the um, people involved in this study and um, especially my collaborator, Dr. Um, Cassida and the students. And also I wanna point out that um, the, our, the grad student working on this project was um, uh, Catherine Macaluso and she was the, uh, the kind of the leader of the project. So, um, which is kind of funny because her name's not here because this is a slide I got from her. So I want to make sure you realize Catherine was the uh, person whose project, whose master's program was revolving around this project. So yeah, that's what I have um, for you guys tonight. And um, yeah, Christoph, I'm glad to answer any questions that you guys might have. Thank you, Richard. So what we're going to do... Um... For now, we're just going to turn it back to James for a moment to do some of the more housekeeping items. We're going to let um, the, the recording is going to come to an end and then we can deal with all the Q's and A's. And uh, Richard, if you can stick around and Matthew, if you're still out there, we can deal with some of the questions out of the chat that haven't been dealt with. So uh, James, to you. Uh, thank you, Christoph, and a uh, big thank you to Richard and to Matthew for your great present, present, present presentations. With that, I do want to go along and to make a big thank you to everybody who has, particularly for you, the audience who has joined tonight. Um, it's been great having you. Uh, we've had a great turnout over the last three sessions. And I uh, would like to go along and to also to thank, uh, first of all, the... Uh, the committee who helped organize this, this is not a one person operation. There's a lot of people behind the scenes that helped to go along and to put this together. So I do want to give a big thank you to uh, Tom Lewis from Ontario Sheep Federation, Ontario Sheep Farmers. I do want to give a big thank you to Bethany Story from Beef Farmers of Ontario, whose uh, support is really important in helping to put these webinars together. I do also want to send a big thank you to uh, my OMAFRA colleagues, Christine O'Reilly, uh, Jake Munro, and Andrew Barry. Um, most more importantly, all, I do want to give a big thank you to all of the speakers, particularly I want to say to uh, Matt and to Dr. Richard Earhart tonight for that talking, but also want to go along and to mention that we've had uh, four other great speakers in Chris McFarlane, Dr. Gillian Bernard, Steve Sickle, and Dr. Mary Janowski. Um, as I say, all of these webinars have been recorded and they will be put up onto uh uh, they were there or they, they will be available online and we will be sending everybody uh, an email with the link to those particular recordings. 